last month, the whole month of October, was our month of service. And uh, it was an incredible month as uh, we had people all from Crossroads go throughout our community uh, to serve and make an impact. And we did hundreds of projects. Uh, I'm excited to report that over 1,700 people uh, participated in our month of service, making it our largest uh, service event ever. And if you were one of those uh, 1,700 plus people, would you raise your hand so we can see who helped? That's awesome. That's awesome. You just need to know the response that we received from the individuals that we helped, the community leaders, the, the organizational representatives, through phone calls, letters, emails, uh, talking to them with, with tears in their eyes uh, of the gratitude that they have for the work that we did, uh, they, they, they were overwhelmed. And uh, that's just a cool thing um, for us to experience and be a part of. And uh, serving is in the DNA of this church. Uh, we believe that we're committed to making a difference in this church and in our community. And that month of service was a great way uh, to make that happen. So thank you so much for your help. Let's keep it up. And in speaking of serving, uh, tomorrow is Veterans Day. And uh, we are so honored to have a church full of men and women who have served our country uh, and one of our armed forces. And if you're a military veteran here today, would you please stand so we can recognize your service? We are truly, truly thankful. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Psalm chapter 25. Psalm 25. At some point in our life, every single one of us have prayed, God, which way is the way I should go? God, should I go to this school? Should, should I break up with, with him? Should I go out with her? Should, should I take the job? God, is this the right place for us to live? Or for you, it may be more sobering questions. Like, is it right for me to separate from my spouse during this season? God, how do I handle this relational difficulty? All of us have been in a time where we didn't know what to do and we cried out to God for help, right? Some of us may be in that spot right now where we're saying, God, I just need the wisdom to choose. How do we know what to do? I would say this is probably one of the main causes of stress in our life is trying to figure this out. I used to be a fan of the show starring Bear Grylls called Man vs. Wild. He's this survival expert and he's placed in these different situations, these treacherous environments with, with no resources and no assistance other than, than what he has on his body. And this year, Netflix released an interactive spin on this show called You vs. Wild. Uh, the premise of the show is pretty much the same, only this time, you as the viewer, you get to choose your own path, where you're given two options, and you choose the option you want Bear to take. So, for example, he could be coming up to a river, and he would say, well, you know, I, I can either try to swing across the river on a vine, or I can try to, to go across the river on this log. Which should I choose? And then you choose either option one or option two, and then you get to see how it all plays out. And I think a lot of us, that's how we see the will of God, is we've got two choices in front of us, and one choice leads to uh, peace and prosperity, and the other one leads to destruction and doom. And how do I know which choice to make? Now, in the show, if you make the wrong choice, it ends up being bad, at the end you can go back and choose the other option and, and, and see if that one was better. And I know a lot of us are thinking, yeah, that'd be great if life worked that way, right? Right? But how do we know what to do? How do we know what God wants us to do in these situations? Does he give us this, this warm, fuzzy, peaceful feeling when we, when we start to think about the, the right decision? Does he give us this, this miracle, this sign in the sky? Now, several years ago, we took a college mission trip to Puerto Rico, and it was late one night. We were sitting on this rooftop patio, kind of debriefing the day. And this one guy in our group, he was talking about how he felt like maybe he was being called to ministry, and he kind of kept on talking, was rambling on, and this airplane flew overhead, and he looked up, and he says, yeah, I see this airplane. Maybe God's calling me to be a pilot. And we all just kind of looked at him like, hey, it's late, man. Maybe you need to go get some sleep. Like, 
You know we're sitting in the direct flight path of the airport. We've had planes flying overhead all night long. I'm not sure you, you want to make a major life decision based on a coincidence. But like, is that the sort of thing that we're looking for? Is this sign? And, and don't shake your head in shock or dismay. Listen, we all do things like that. We do. Um, for many of us, we, we want God to be our magic eight ball, right? Just, just think about these things that, that we want to know. Like, um, will, will, will the Cowboys make the playoffs? <laughs> All signs point to yes. Okay, there we go. Um, are, uh, are cats evil? Seems likely. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> How about this one? This, this one won't be polarized at all. I know people have opinions on this. Is it wrong to play Christmas music before, thanks, or before Thanksgiving? <laughs> Up to you. There we go. <laughs> that settles it, right? But, but, that, but that's what we do, it is, is we want God to be our magic eight ball so that we'll know what to do in any situation. Well, today I want to acquaint you with Psalm 25 because it's all about how God guides So with your Bibles turned there, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Psalm 25, beginning in verse 1. It says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, before we dive in too deep to this, I want to give you a little bit of perspective. Up until about 50 years ago, um, there wasn't any really talk about knowing the will of God and at least in terms of personal decision making. If you look throughout church history, you'll be hard-pressed to find a sermon on this topic. Yet, of course, today we're all obsessed by it. You go to any Christian conference and it will be the most popular topic. And in over 12 years of college ministry, I can tell you it's the question that I've received more than any other. Is how do I know the will of God? And I think the relative absence of it and the sudden obsession of it in our day can by itself teach us something important. You see, previous generations didn't worry about discerning the will of God, but in our culture, we're all about individualism and self-actualization and security. And so the will of God becomes a way that we can guarantee we get all of those things. That's why many of us have turned the will of God into an idol. And we want to know the will of God more than we want to know God himself. We think finding the will of God is going to remove all uncertainty from our lives and help us achieve our dreams. Now, the Bible does talk about God's guidance, but it, points, it puts the emphasis in different places. The Bible puts much more emphasis on knowing and trusting God and becoming the kind of person God wants you to be than it ever does in detecting some sort of mystical guidance in a situation. In fact, here's your big idea from this psalm. The question is not how God guides, but whom God guides. Guidance is not something God gives you, as much as something he does for you. And so the question is, are you the kind of person that God guides? Psalm 25 is written by David. It's a, it's a prayer of, of him asking for God's guidance. Let's start with verse 12. It says, Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. What you should notice is that the guidance that David trusts God for touches on a lot of different things. In this psalm, there are allusions to relationships and family, career choices, even parenting decisions. In verse 15, David trusts God to keep him from disaster. He says to to, to pluck his feet from out of the net. 
Verse 17, David trusts God to guide him through these things that are bringing him stress. And so if you're thinking that maybe God only cares about the spiritual stuff, you just need to put that away. We see David trusting God's guidance over every square inch of his life, from his career to his relationships to his parenting and everything in between. David sums up his hope at the beginning and the end of this psalm. And in verse 2, he says, Oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame in any decision I make. Verse 20, Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame. Again, in any area of my life. Why? For I take refuge in you. And so here at the beginning, let me point out a couple of really incredible promises that David clings to. Promise number one, David declares other people can't destroy God's will for my life. All throughout this psalm, David talks about enemies who are trying to ruin his life. In verse two, he says, Let not my enemies exult over me. Verse 19, consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. There are some of you, when you look back on your life, you see how somebody else really messed it up. You you can point to a parent or you can point to an ex-spouse or a business partner or a relative. David had those people too. And he says, I trust that your promises and guidance are greater and more powerful than any of my enemies' evil intentions against me. It's hard here not to think of Joseph in the book of Genesis. If you're not familiar with the story of Joseph, he is a man who is sold into slavery by his brothers, and he's wrong greatly at their hand. He's taken in slavery down to Egypt, where he experiences racial discrimination and unjust accusations. He's an innocent man who's thrown into prison for a long time, and he just experiences suffering upon suffering. But later in his life, he is elevated to to the position of second in in command of all of Egypt. And he's he's in a position to bring an act of great blessing and deliverance to Israel. And he faces his brothers, those those brothers who who betrayed him all those years earlier, and, and he said to them, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And I, that's the belief, by the way, that enabled Joseph to forgive his brothers. Because he knew that even though they wronged him, God had overwritten their wrong for good in his life. And let me just tell you, if you're here today and you're struggling with an area of bitterness towards somebody, if there's somebody in your past that you can't forgive, I guarantee you, if you trace it down to its root, it's that you don't actually believe or you haven't reconciled the fact that even though they meant it for evil, God can still use it for good in your life. That doesn't mean that they didn't do you wrong. It doesn't mean that you don't hurt. And it doesn't mean that God has in any way released them from responsibility. But what it means is that God's grace is so amazing that he can take the wrongs of others and he can turn it in for good. And that is God's promise. In fact, here's my challenge for you. A little homework, and I'm being serious about this. I would encourage you to spend some time by yourself this week. Get out a piece of paper, get get an index card, and and write out the name of that person who hurt you. That that, that family member, that friend, that that ex-spouse, that boss. You write down their name and you say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And you do that for seven days and you pray that back to God and you come back here seven days from now and don't tell me that you don't have a different attitude towards that person in that chapter of your life. Promise number two, my own past sins don't permanently disqualify me from God's will either. At least twice in this psalm, David asked God for forgiveness for past mistakes. One of those is here in verse 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Not little guilt, not not JV guilt. We're talking about varsity, big league guilt here. And yet even with great guilt and sin, he still prays for God's guidance and his perfect plan for his life. And here's what you need to see. David believes that God's promises are greater than even his own past mistakes. And some of you are thinking, well, I, I get that, that, that God will protect me from the mistakes of others, but, but my own mistakes? It, it sure seems like God may just let me suffer and say, you brought it on yourself. And it is true. Sins and mistakes bring consequences into your life, and they can be painful, and sometimes they can be irreversible in this life. But what David is saying is even those don't disqualify you from God's ultimate plan for your life. Again, I'm, I'm reminded of the book of Genesis. 
the story of Jacob, a man who, who commits a lot of different sin, like when he betrays his, his brother and, and lies to his brother by, by taking his birthright from him. And, and that act causes him to be estranged from his family, and so he ends up fleeing and running away to a foreign land, and it's in that foreign land that he meets the love of his life, Rachel. And from his relationship to her comes the line of the Messiah. Now, he got into that relationship because of some sinful choices that he made. Does that mean that the Messiah was plan B? Was Jesus part of the wrong plan? Of course not. Well, well does that mean that, that it's no big deal that Jacob sinned? No. That sin affected him for the rest of his life. But it shows you the unbelievable mystery of God's grace that he can take our sinful decisions and he can stamp, he can write his plan on them. And if you're willing to trust God, even your own past sins don't disqualify you from God's ultimate destiny for your life. That's why David could declare in verse 10, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. All the paths. There's not a single thing that God does in my life that's not done with steadfast love and faithfulness. And even when I turn my back on him, he will never turn his back on me. Let me apply this another way. I know people who were born out of sinful circumstances. Maybe you were born out of wedlock and you wonder, am I a mistake? In fact, maybe you've even been told that, that you're a mistake. No, friend, you're not. Maybe the circumstances by which you came into this world were sinful, and that's on your parents. But you are not a mistake. And here's how I know this. Jesus himself came into this world through a series of sinful choices of others, and he's definitely not a mistake. And if he's not a mistake, then you aren't either. So as you can see, these are some incredible promises. And so the question then becomes, what do I have to do to experience this kind of guidance? Remember, the question in this psalm is not how God guides, but it's whom God guides. And so what kind of person receives God's guidance? I want you to notice four characteristics from this psalm. Number one, those trained in the ways of God. Verse 4, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. David is talking here about this, this inner awareness with the ways of God that trains him almost instinctively how to act in various situations. Now think of it the way an athlete trains. A coach can't train an athlete exactly how to respond in every situation because the defense is always changing. But what a coach can do is train the athlete how to read situations and then equip them with the skills to respond when a particular situation is upon them. I remember years ago an interview that was done with Michael Jordan. It was a key point in the game where he had done this move where he split the defense and he got into the lane and he jumped up in the air and did this acrobatic off-balance shot to score a basket that helped seal the game and allowed the Bulls to win. And after the game, the interviewer asked him, did you know what you were going to do before you, before you jump? And Michael's response was, I jump and then I decide in the air. In other words, what he's saying is, is those aren't planned moves. That they're in the moment responses that come from skilled training. Here's how the New Testament talks about this. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 13. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. When he says to distinguish good from evil, he's talking about those things that aren't specifically outlined in Scripture. So how, how do you know that? Well, because if, if the Bible says it, then you don't need to be trained to distinguish good from evil because it's written right there on the page. By constant practice, it means that you've been You've been so saturated in Scripture and so skilled in its application that in the moment you have this instinct to determine good from evil because it's almost become second nature to you. And so to, to go back to my illustration about athletes, there are times today where uh, I'll get out on the basketball court and I'll play. Like I played in, in the Crossroads Men's League. And um, some of you may be at this point in your life like me where like the mind says one thing but the body won't obey. You know what I'm talking about? So like in my mind, I know what I want to do. I want to get to this place on the floor. I, I, want, to, I want to cross over. I want to try to get to, to the rim. But when it comes to the execution of it, 
I look less like a graceful athlete and more like a wounded duck coming in for a crash landing, okay? So say, why? Well, because I'm not trained through constant practice. My, My playing now is sporadic at best. And so since I'm not trained through constant practice, I'm not able to respond with instinct. It might also be due to the fact that I'm not 20 anymore, but that's beyond, that's beyond my point. So, so let me give you an action step here. You need to get saturated in God's ways. So saturated that, that you begin to think in patterns of Scripture. Because you will not live out the will of God any more than you know the Word of God. Did you hear that? You won't live out the will of God any more than you know the Word of God. And there are some of you sitting here thinking, I I want to know the the, the will of God, but but you're not devoting yourself to the Word of God, and and you're just kidding yourself. Because it's more of an instinct than it is an instruction. You become the kind of person that God wants you to be. You become the kind of person who understands God's ways, and you'll end up being the kind of person who chooses what He wants you to choose. The second characteristic of those God who got the second characteristic of those God guides is those obedient to the commands of God. Verse 9. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Humble means you believe that God's ways are best. The opposite of that, of course, is pride, is where you assume that your way is better than God's. And David is saying, God's promise to give guidance in the areas that Scripture doesn't address is extended to those who are obeying Him in the areas that the Scriptures do address. And when you disobey, you proudly assume that your way is better than God's, and you cut yourself off from the guidance. Like there are some of you right now who who you're praying for for God's wisdom in, in some area over here. You're praying for God's wisdom about a relationship or a job or some future plan, but you're disobeying Him over here in some area that He's already He's already said. And you need to stop talking about this because God doesn't want to talk about this until you've dealt with that. For example, some couples right now that they're praying about their future while they're, while they're living together unmarried. And I'm like, why are you talking about his direction here when you're clearly living in, in defiance of what he said over here? God's not going to give you wisdom in the areas that Scripture doesn't address until you're humble enough to obey what it does address. Why are you asking for his help when when you're living in defiance to what he's already said? There are some people who are praying about wisdom, about a job situation, and they're not obeying God and and the principles of generosity. And God's like, why are you talking to me about my provision in this area over here that I haven't addressed when you're disobeying me in this area that I have addressed? You you see, there's a humility that God leads that is demonstrated by an obedience to his commands. But I know there are others of you who you've been obeying God and it it feels like your obedience is only leading you to more difficulty. Maybe you're here and you're saying, God, why aren't I married yet? And it seems like the longer you obey, the further you are away from marriage. And the further away you are from marriage, the more tempted you are to compromise by either being with somebody who's not God's choice or, or engaging in immorality. And I'm just telling you, to experience the guidance of God, you have to follow His ways. Or maybe you're concerned about your business and you're tempted to to compromise your integrity to get ahead. Or or, or maybe uh, telling the truth could hurt your career and so you're tempted to lie to your boss. Ultimately, you have to decide whom you trust with your future. Waiting on God means doing things His way and trusting Him to exalt you in His time. Disobedience means taking matters in your own hands, which leads to disgrace. So number two, those obedient to the commands of God. Number three, those trusting in the promises of God. Verse three says, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. The word wait there implies that sometimes you're in a place where you don't see the promise fulfilled yet, and that's a hard place to be. I've been there. And you're saying, "I I don't see it working out. And God says, just wait. Trust me. It takes time. And in the waiting, God gives guidance to the person who trusts in him and walks in his way. You say, okay, trained in the ways of God, obedient to the commands of God, trusting in the promises of God. All right, practically speaking, like what's that mean when I'm in the moment and I really have a decision to make? 
Here's what it means. It means you take advantage of every means of wisdom you have at your disposal. You've, you've read through Scripture. You've spent time in prayer with God. You're sensitive to the way that God's Spirit may be leading you. You've consulted the, the counsel of godly men and women. You take all of that into consideration, and then you make the decision as best as you can, and you trust that God is guiding you just like he's promised you he would. That's the key. My, my favorite verse on this is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding or your own ability to figure out what God wants. Trust in God's ability to show you, not in your ability to figure it out. Verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Now there are two phrases there in verse 6. One is yours and one is God's. Yours is in all your ways acknowledge him. That means you obey what you know to obey. You seek the wisdom that's at your disposal. What's his promise? His promise is he will make straight your paths. Which means that in any decision that I make, after I've done everything that God has told me to do, I just make the decision and I say, thank you God that it's not even on me how to figure out how to get this right. I've done everything that you've told me to do. Now you've promised that you are going to make straight my paths, and so I'm trusting you to do what you said you would do. In these moments, I have found it's helpful to pray what's called the sheep prayer. You say, what's the sheep prayer? Well, when, when God was looking for an analogy for you, an animal, for you in the Bible, what animal did he choose? Sheep. Okay, so sheep is your spirit animal, okay? It's not an otter or a lion or whatever. Your, your spirit animal is a sheep. So there's some bad news and some good news. You want the bad news first? Okay. Sheep are idiots. <laughs> Anyone who knows sheep know that sheep are like the dumbest animals, okay? That they can't defend themselves. They can't run very well. They've got terrible vision. They can only see like four feet ahead of them. They, they stumble down into streams. They fall over. They drown. They're, they're completely helpless, Okay. And so God, in heaven, when he looked down on you and said, I need an animal to choose for them, to represent them, he said, I'm going to choose sheep. That's the bad news, right? That, that even the wisest among you, when it comes to guidance and figuring things out, you're an idiot, okay? That's the bad news. At this point, you probably want some good news, okay? Here's the good news. You've got a great shepherd. And hear this, if sheep get to where sheep need to go, it won't be because of their competence as sheep. It will always be because of the competence and the compassion of their shepherd. Because even the worst sheep are an idiot, okay? So here's what this looks like. Here's how we pray this. Lord, I have this decision. And God, I have done my best to listen to you in every way possible. I've got all sorts of godly counsel. I prayed about this, and this is what I think I'm going to do. I'm choosing this. But God, you said that I was a sheep, which means I have no confidence in my ability to make this decision, but I do have confidence in your compassion and your willingness and your competence as a shepherd to guide me. And so God, if this is the wrong decision, if I'm going the wrong way, would you as a shepherd use your staff and your rod to get me to where I need to go? And thank God, Proverbs 3, 5 says it's not on you. You don't have to lean on your own understanding, but you can trust in the Lord and in his willingness to guide you. And that is an awesome place to be. And it's stress-free. And I'm telling you, God gave up on your decision-making ability way back in the Garden of Eden. And that's where God looked at you and he said, okay, if they get to where they need to go, it won't be because of their competence as sheep. It's going to be because of my compassion and my willingness and my competence to guide them. And that is an awesome place to be in trusting God. And that, friends, is what Psalm 25 is promising you. Remember, the question in this psalm is not how God guides but whom God guides. Because guidance in the Bible is not as much something God gives you as it is something he does for you. You become the kind of person God wants you to be and you trust him with the rest. Let me, let me give you one more image. Uh, this here is, is a Texas roadmap, okay? I was thinking about opening it up, but it's huge and I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to fold it back together, okay? I'm a sheep, okay? So, uh, 
this here uh, is, a, if those of you under the age of 30, this is what people used to use to figure out where to go, okay? <laughs> and I would venture to say that this caused more marital difficulty with our parents than just about anything else, okay? Some of you are having traumatic flashbacks to a family road trip where you're pulled over on the side of the road with your lights flashing while mom and dad hash out why they missed the exit back there, okay? But I think this is what most people are looking for when they want to know the will of God, is they want a map. Um, Elizabeth Elliot, in her book, A Slow and Certain Light, she tells the story of when she was in the Amazon jungle. She was a missionary to Ecuador. And she ran across a couple of explorers from America, and they asked her for some directions to, to get to a place that they wanted to go. And she said, hey, this is the jungle. There's no roads. There's just trees everywhere. And they said, well, just draw us a map, and, and we're confident that, that we can get to where we need to go. And she's like, I'm confident you won't. But she went ahead and she drew them a map, gave it to them. She never heard from them, never saw them again. Maybe they made it. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they're, today they're still out there wandering in the jungle somewhere. But here's what she said. She said, in some places you don't need a map, you need a guide. You need a guide who understand things so well that they can guide you to the right place. And a map just overwhelms you. Ma maps are overwhelming. And what Psalm 25 offers you is not a map. It offers, you, it offers you a relationship with a guide. And it says that this God will walk with you and if you trust in him and obey him, he will control things and he will arrange decisions and he won't let other people, he won't even let you mess it up if you commit yourself to him as your shepherd and trust in his ability to guide you. Well, finally, one last one. I'll close with this. Those trained in the ways of God, those obedient to the commands of God, those trusting in the promises of God. Number four, those depending on the grace of God. Several times in this psalm, David talks about God's rescue of him. He talks about God's forgiveness and deliverance, and in verse 10, he rejoices, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. In Hebrew, that word steadfast love is hased. It means covenant, unconditional love, where I know that God, everything God is doing in my life is based on his unconditional love. Listen, what haunts many of us in our pursuit of God's will is the suspicion that maybe God still has mixed feelings towards us. Maybe he's still holding a grudge against us for some past mistakes or some sins that we committed in the past. And so what this looks like is that in any good blessing that we receive, we're always waiting on the other shoe to drop, right? Because you almost see God in heaven going, well, you can't really expect life to be that good. Are you serious? You really don't deserve to be that happy. So you got this good thing. I'm going to have to pay you back with this bad thing over here. Friends, what King David would tell us, and what the good news of the gospel is, is that how God guides you from this point on and what God gives you is no longer based on the worthiness of how you live, but it's on the worthiness of how Jesus lived. That's said. That's covenant love. It's that Jesus took the punishment so that you could receive the blessing. And so David could say, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness because all of the wrath was poured out on Jesus in my place. The New Testament way of saying this is Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It means that all that God had against me, all the reason he would have to condemn, got poured out on Jesus, which means that I don't need to wait for the other shoe to drop on, on a blessing because it dropped on Jesus. And it dropped on him so that what remains for me is joy and goodness and blessing. Proverbs 10.22 says, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow with it because he poured out all the sorrow on Jesus, the man of sorrows so that what would remain for me is joy and goodness. You see, church, in the gospel, I can embrace my promise to walk in blessing all the days of my life. In Christ, I am blessed with every spiritual blessing. All the promises of God are yes in Christ. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Or to quote David one more time, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because all the condemnation and all the evil was poured out on Jesus so that I could walk in the assurance of his constant intention to bless me every second of every day for the rest of my eternity. And that is a great place to be. And if you're here today and you're wondering, how do I know which way to go? And you've never surrendered your life to Jesus? The direction I would point you is to go directly to the cross. Let's pray.